Welcome to Excess Returns, where we focus on what works over the long term in the markets. Join us as we talk about the strategies and tactics that can help you become a better long-term investor. Justin Carboneau and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital. In this episode of Excess Returns, Jack and I discuss the origin, benefits, and implementation of a systematic value investing model that utilizes and combines multiple value metrics simultaneously. We hope you enjoy the discussion. All right, so I wrote a article earlier um, a few months ago about the idea of combining multiple um, value measures together. And the idea came from research that was done by James O'Shaughnessy um, and a strategy that he wrote about. But where, where I thought we could start the conversation today is just sort of taking a step back and talking about the various ways that you can systematically follow value strategies. Because on Validia, I think there's, of the 22 strategies we run publicly, I think more than 50% of them have some value component or value bias. Um, So maybe let's start there and let's just talk about like some basic ways that value investing techniques can be um, incorporated into these types of systematic strategies. And then I think let's get into the, the value composite model in a little bit more detail. But maybe to start, we'll, we'll kind of look at like the Ben Graham model, which is, you know, a very basic value model. Um, and that looks at things like simple things like the P.E. ratio or the price to book to uncover, you know, cheap stocks. I mean, that's one way you can use these types of value metrics to find value stocks. Yeah, like you got to, you know, value People like to think value is, is a pretty simple concept, but value can actually be very complex. And there's, there's a lot of different ways to measure value. You, know, you just referenced Graham with the PE and the price to book, but there, there are many value metrics. There's the price to sales, there's the EV to EBITDA, there's price to cash flow. There's, there's some more advanced metrics people use. And you know, when you're trying to build a value strategy, selecting how you build it can be very important because all these metrics we just listed, the performance of those metrics over time can be very different, especially over short periods of time. So if, if you build a value strategy for the next five years and you use these different metrics, you have you may have very, very different experiences in, in how your value strategy works. And, and so it's important to understand what's going on behind the scenes with value. And like you said, we have probably 50% of our strategies are value, but they each look at value in a very different way. Some start with price to book, some start with PE, some start with EV to EBITDA. And as we'll talk about a little bit later, some of them try to build composites, which combine all of them together. And each one of those produces very different results. Right. And for us, when we're talking about uh, value investing strategies, what we're doing is using these metrics and these measures, and we're basically trying to assess, is the company cheap based on something like the price earnings multiple relative to other companies or price to sales relative to other companies. So that is an important distinction. A lot of times people use the word value investing interchangeably. And for us, when we're talking about systematic value investing, it's using these ratios to look at whether or not a stock is cheap relative to others. Right. We're, we're looking at value in the academic sense. And so when, when academic papers are, are written, they typically will take a value metric and they will sort the entire universe by that value metric. And then they will buy the, the cheapest stocks based on whichever metric they're using. You know, typically it's been priced to book, but they'll, you know, they call it deciles. So, you know, if you buy the cheapest 10 percent of your database based on price to book, you're buying the cheapest decile. And so th- that's the academic form of value investing. And that, that's the type of value investing our, our quantitative strategies use as well. Right. And that might be a good jumping off point to sort of start to ease into this value composite model, which um, we base our value composite model on the work done by James O'Shaughnessy and what works on Wall Street. Um, O'Shaughnessy, what works on Wall Street was originally published in 96. Um, He's published multiple editions um, after that. And what O'Shaughnessy did was he looked at, you know, fundamental ratios, metrics, Um, And then the combination of those metrics to try to find strategies that have worked best over time. So he was able to use um, the S&P CompuStat point in time database to backtest his methodologies back to 1964. So there's over 50 years of research behind the models that O'Shaughnessy has tested. Um, We run multiple strategies based on his work. And one of them is this value composite um, strategy. And to your point about price to book, 
um, you know, price to book, like you said, was in the academic world, it's oftentimes the, the value metric that is used the most. Um, what, but what O'Shaughnessy found is that, you know, price to book is actually the least effective value metric over the long term um, in his testing. That's right. Uh, and pretty much any other, uh, you know, most of the other research out there will agree with him as well. You know, if you rank all the value factors over time, price to book will be at the bottom of the list. And so getting at the composite issue, though, there, there's an important question you ask first when you're building a value strategy. And, and there's sort of two ways you can go with it. One way is, I think I know what the best way to measure value is. And, it, and in that case, you might take that value metric and you might build your portfolio around that. The second is, I don't know. And I'm not sure which one is going to be the best over time. And so in that case, you might use a composite of metrics and you might say, I'm not sure which one's going to work out here. Let me put them all together and let me try to get an overall measure of value. And I don't think either one of them is wrong. You know, we know firms that do both of them. You know, our friends at Alpha Architect like EV to EBITDA. And so they use the primary, they use that as their primary metric and use primarily a one metric system. Whereas our, our O'Shaughnessy uses more of a composite system and they both can work over time. And it really depends on if, the metric you're selecting ends up being the best or one of the better metrics, or if you know you're better off just getting that average over time. And, and yeah. there, there's no right or wrong way to do it. But the the argument for a composite is that if I can't figure out which value metric is going to be best going forward, my best my best option may be just to measure value using a, a bunch of different ways, and then I'll get like an average performance of value over time. Right, and that's one thing. When O'Shaughnessy, in O'Shaughnessy's first edition of What Works on Wall Street, he used the price to sales ratio. That tended to be the most effective. But what he then was able to test and realize, to your point, was that you know these value metrics, you know, have different periods where they, one may work better than another, and the combination of them actually gives you, you know, better long-term risk-adjusted returns because you're getting more of a balance. Um, Ba you know, balancing out of these of these metrics over different periods of time. Let's let's um, talk about what goes into the value composite model and what metrics are being utilized. Do you want to give a quick overview? Sure. So the the VC two model in the book, I believe, was uh, price to book, price to earnings, price to sales, uh, price to cash flow, EV to EBITDA, and shareholder yield. I, I believe those were the ones in the book. Um, since then, O'Shaughnessy has, has dropped price to book based on the long term record of, you know, of price to book being one of the worst performers of the value strategy. So my understanding of their current composite is it no longer includes price to book. But when we implement a strategy, we implement it directly from the published writings. And so we still are using price to book as one of the metrics inside of the VT, VC2 composite. Yeah. And the shareholder yield, I think, was added in not as a value factor as much as it just helped improve the risk adjusted performance of the portfolio over that period of time. But one of the things that O'Shaughnessy talks about in what works on Wall Street is if you look at those various metrics, you know, those are tied out to different financial statements. So, you know, price to earnings and price to sales are the income statement. You have price to book, even though he's not using that anymore. I mean, that's your balance sheet. And then you have, you know, price to cash flow and enterprise value to EBITDA. Um, that's sort of getting at your cash flow statement. So what's nice about that is all those metrics are tied out to specific financial statements that, you know, an investor would be a fundamental investor would be looking at to determine, you know, basically the health and the cash flow and the profitability of the company um, and how those things stack up. Right. And overall, you're getting a general representation of value. Like you said, you're getting different statements. You're getting different ways to measure those statements. You're trying to get just a general representation of is this company cheap and you know, I wrote a, pe pe a paper recently where I talked about each of these metrics and each of them has some significant flaws. You know, ev everybody talks about price to book right now and says, you know, it, there's major issues with price to book. And there are, you know, price to book does not measure intangible assets and intangible assets are a huge part of the economy right now. There are a lot of companies right now with negative equity and, and price to book can't handle companies with negative equity. So there are a lot of issues with price to book. But when you look at the other metrics, they have issues as well. They may not be as big, but, you know, price to sales, for instance, well, price to sales doesn't consider at all whether a company is actually profitable. You know, in these days where with technology, the, we may be seeing more separation between the companies that are very profitable and the companies that are not. And so not even including that profitability in your measurement, you know, there's some significant issues with that. And you can go on and on about each one of the metrics. They, they all have their flaws. And, and that's an argument for the composite is you're, you're sort of blending all those flaws together, which may be minimizing each one of them individually. Mm, that's a great point, actually.
Yeah, no metric is no metric is the end all be all. Even though in O'Shaughnessy's research, I think the best long term one was EBITDA to enterprise value, or we might flip it sometimes and say enterprise value to EBITDA. But that was in his testing. That was the the value metric that actually performed the best. And I think in your article, that might have been the one that had the weakest argument in it. But still, it's you could probably make a case against that too in some way. Yeah, you can. And you know, the, the argument against that is that it tends to favor asset heavy firms. So by adding back depreciation, you know, depreciation is, is a non-cash expense, but if you have a bunch of assets on your books, those assets do require maintenance. And so by adding back depreciation, you're taking firms that have a lot of assets and you're sort of moving them up the list. And so you, you could argue it unfairly favors these asset heavy type of firms versus the asset light type of firms. Mm. But you're right. I mean, that, that, that's not as strong a case as the case against the, the arguments against price to book, but every one of these metrics has, has some degree of an issue with it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so getting back to how this value composite can actually be implemented in a strategy, um, let's talk about that. So within all of our stocks in the database, we basically rank each stock by each value metric, correct? Correct. So, so we basically take the entire database and we sort it by each value metric. And we rank stocks, you know, one, two. I mean, our, our universe right now is about 2,800 companies. So we rank from one to 2,800 on all of these different metrics. And then what we do is we take those rankings and we combine them together. So we add them together. So if a stock ranked, you know, first according to this metric and 10th according to the next metric, it would have, after those first two metrics, it would have a score of 11. And we keep adding those scores together. And then at the end, what that gives you is the stocks that, have, that are the cheapest across all the metrics will have the lowest composite scores. And, and those are the stocks, you know, after we apply some quality filters, those are the stocks that end up being put in the portfolio. Okay, right. So it's like the, the top one and two percent of the stocks, according to the value composite ranking, are the ones that, you know, are held in the model portfolios that we run. That's correct. Yeah. And in O'Shaughnessy's testing back to 1964, I think he showed a portfolio of the top ranked value. Uh, he calls it the VC2 or the value composite 2. Um, I think it had like a back tested return of 18% annually. And in our model, at least the best performing one that we run, it's a similar type of return since the end of 08. It's one of the better, what's interesting is that it's one of the better performing value models that we actually run and track on Validity. And I think it's because it gets a more diverse, rather than just using something like price to book, like we just talked about, you're getting a more diverse set of companies in there. Um, and these, you know, these different ratios don't sort of overweight or bring you into, let's say, a deep, deep value area like energy or some other place that's been problematic. You get, I think, a little bit more diversified portfolio by using these different value metrics. Right. And in 08, it's been an interesting, since 08, it's been an interesting period because you have seen wide spreads between the various value metrics. You know, you've seen price to book on the bottom. Price to book has struggled the most by far of all the value factors since 08. And things like EV to EBITDA have done better. And so, th again, you get the benefit of the composite there that, you know, you're, if, if you're using the academic definition of value and you're only using price to book, you would have had a much worse experience than bringing these all together. And, and the second point is, which you, which you just made, is that it also helps from a sector perspective because all of these metrics can tend to focus on a specific sector at times. For instance, price to book right now likes a lot of financials. And by using the composite, even without having sector rules on their own, you're, you're creating a more diverse sector spread among all the, the different stocks in your portfolio. And so that's another advantage of a composite is you, you just get a more even balance between all the sectors. Yeah. All right. So I think for, you know, investors out there that are looking at these types of metrics, we hope that the biggest the most important takeaway is, you know, don't just look at one. You probably want to look at multiple. Um, you know, if you can implement it in a systematic way, great. Um, I think that's a very powerful way to do it, but some investors may not have the tools to do it. So even if you're just doing general research for a stock, you know, looking at multiple value measures like the ones that were tested and outlined by O'Shaughnessy can certainly, I think, help in terms of, um, you know, selecting value companies. Would you agree with that? Yeah, as, as our friend Corey Hofstein says, you know, you, you don't want to take risks unless you're going to get compensated for those risks. And so picking one value metric 
a lot of people would argue that that's an uncompensated risk. So I'm not going to get any extra return trying to pick my favorite value metric versus just trying to use a composite of all of them. So for most people, unless you're somebody who, you know, has done a lot of research on this and you really feel strongly you found the right metric, for most people using a blend of metrics will probably be a better experience, both from a return perspective, but also from a behavioral perspective, because it'll be easier to stick with. It'll have less ups and downs than any individual value metric. Right. That's a great way to end it, I think. So, all right. Well, everyone, thanks for uh, watching. We hope you enjoyed this episode. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Hi, guys. This is Justin again. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Excess Returns. You can follow Jack on Twitter at, at @practicalquant. You can follow me on Twitter at, at JJ Carboneau. If you found this discussion interesting and valuable, please subscribe in either iTunes or on YouTube or leave a review or a comment. We appreciate it.